Hi everyone and happy snow apocalypse. I hope you are all enjoying your snow day. Um, however, since we only have 13 meetings, I decided the best way to make up this lecture uh, was for me to just record for you uh, my lecture using QuickTime. But before we get into the actual lecture, I do want to show you guys something I've posted on Blackboard Vista for you, and that is this handout um, that you see right here on how to write a book review. And it's on Blackboard Vista under course documents in the book review uh, folder. Uh, just to remember, just to remind you that your book review is due in my inbox on March 4th, so you do have a lot of time. But one of the things that this book review does is it talks about what is a book review as well as ways to, things to think about as you are reading the book and how to go about actually writing a book review. And it gives examples of uh, what makes good uh, book reviews. So I just suggest reading through this um, at your leisure um, sometime between now and next week. And if you like, we can discuss things like expectations or um, strategies of how to do this during our discussion portion of, of next week's class. So again, this is on Blackboard Vista, so please take a look at it at your leisure. Now for today's class, we are going to be looking at uh, women in colonial uh, New England. And one of the things I want to start off with is I want you to think real quick to yourselves what types of language you might want on your epitaph, on your, on your gravestone one day. What do you think is what you, what do you think you would want to be remembered for? What type of qualities do you want the world to forever associate yourself with? And here's some examples of some more modern day epitaphs, just to give you some ideas. This one here is Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She was one of um, the leaders of the women's suffrage movement. And if you look at her uh, gravestone, you can see that she wanted to be remembered as a mother, an author, an orator, as well as the leader of the women's suffrage movement. And here we have a list of some of her accomplishments. Over here we have Rosa Parks. Uh, she wanted to be remembered as the mother of the modern day civil rights movement. And down here, we have Martin Luther King Jr., who, of course, has one of the most famous lines of one of his speeches, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. So here we have a commemoration of one of his speeches, as well as him proclaiming his faith. Now over here, this is Merv Griffin's tombstone, and you might know him as the powerhouse behind uh, game shows such as Jeopardy! and uh, Wheel of Fortune. And of course, he has a joke on his as he will not be back right after these messages. These are ways in which these four particular individuals wanted to be remembered for the rest of the time. Um, and they wanted to be uh, presented to future generations. But for women in colonial New England, that's they wanted to be seen as good Christian mothers and wives. This is an epitaph of good wife, uh, and good wife is a term that's used to describe uh, married women. Good wife Dorothea Dudley. She was actually the mother of Anne Bradstreet, who's a very famous poet from this time period. And when she died, her children, her daughter, wrote this epitaph for her. And just to look through it real quick, here lies a worthy matron of an unspotted life a loving mother and obedient wife, a friendly neighbor, pitiful to the poor, whom off she fed and clothed with her store, to servants wisely awful but yet kind, as they do so they reward did find, a true instructor of her family, the which she ordered with dexterity. The public meetings ever did frequent, and in her closet constant hours she spent Religious in all her words and ways, preparing still for death till end of days. Of all her children's children lived to see, when dying left a blessed memory. Now before we analyze this in any great detail, I think there's two uh, words that we really need to think about because the meaning that we have today for them is very different than the meaning uh, that Bradstreet means in this. For example, uh, pitiful to the poor doesn't uh, that means she has pity for the poor. She's full of pity. And in that vein, you will also see awful. 
um, this means full of awe. Uh, so to the search, so this uh, doesn't mean that she's mean to them, but that she inspires awe um, from them. So respect. Now, oftentimes when we think about colonial New England women, we tend to associate them with uh, things like the Salem witchcraft. Um, so we think of them as women who were either witches or women who ratted on other women as witches. But in truth, most uh, New England women aspired to be good wives. Or the short for that is a goodie. It's a nickname. And so today we're going to talk about what does it take to be considered a goodie or a good wife in New England culture. Now to start off with, we really need to take a second and look at uh, these New England settlers. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the people who came to New England was, in general, these are people who are going to be of the more middling sort, so more middle class people. This means that they could actually afford to pay uh, to transport themselves across the Atlantic Ocean. And this, of course, is in juxtaposition to settlers who came to places like the South. Uh, most of those people were poor and therefore had to become indentured servants in order to afford the trip across the Atlantic. Another interesting difference between the people who came to New England and the people who came to the South was that in the North, the majority of people migrate as family units. So husband, wife, kids, or at least husband and wife are going to come together. And this is going to be in juxtaposition with the South, but what we're going to see is predominantly men coming over, young single men coming over by themselves. And finally, one of the differences we're going to see in New England is that in New England, we're going to see uh, colonial authorities working really hard to settle people in towns. Uh, and they're going to encourage them to settle in towns because um, it favors um, protection. Uh, if you can concentrate people into one area, you can have protection against, say, uh, Native American attacks or attacks from the north, because, of course, New France is right here, and the French are constantly invading into Massachusetts and other colonial areas as the English and the French go to war. Um, but in addition to allow towns allowing uh, defense, if you concentrate everybody together, the people in these towns are able to support public schools, uh, support churches, and it allows for neighbors to uh, supervise each other, uh, make sure that they're not doing anything immoral. So this is uh, really how we see New England being settled by middle class people, and that's really what we're going to focus on today, in families and in towns. So then, again, what does it take to be a good wife? Now, one of the things that I think is important to keep in mind that is for most women who are living in New England between, say, 1650 and 1750, being a mature woman, being an adult, was pretty much synonymous with being a wife. Almost all women who reached the age of maturity were married. And this is in contrast to, say, places like England, where as much as 10% of the adult female population would be single. Another thing that's really interesting about New England is that we're going to see women getting married younger in New England than in places like England. Um, and we're going to also see that the gap between the average age of a wife at her first marriage and the average age of a husband at his is going to be a lot larger in New England than in places like England. So just to give you some examples, the average age of woman of a woman in New England was 20 years old, and the average age of a man was 24. And of course, that gap could be much larger. Uh, for example, Abigail Adams was nine years younger than John Adams. So one of the things that's interesting is, you know, this gap might have made it easier for women to revere, fear, and obey their husbands as they had been taught in their society and by scripture. Let me just give you an example of this. Thomas Dudley, the husband of uh, Dorothy, whose epitaph we just looked at, told uh, his daughter Mercy, quote, Know that God hath graciously placed thy husband here, and will be here with thee, and comfort thee, if thou submit and trust him. Basically, Dudley is telling his daughter, submit to God, because this is your religious duty, and 
God will be there for you. So it's not just um, you should submit to your husband, but you need to do it for these religious reasons. And what's interesting is this law, this religious tradition of, of a wife submitting to her husband is actually a legal requirement in New England. And this is something known as coverture. Basically, coverture means that when a man and woman get married, they legally, the two become one. Uh, and that one is the husband. Under laws of coverture, a wife's legal identity is subsumed into her husband's. And we can see this most readily when it comes to her name. So, Abigail Adams. Her maiden name was Abigail Smith. But when Abigail Smith married Abigail, uh, married John Adams, legally she was required to take his name. She could not keep her maiden name. She could not hyphenate it and be Smith Adams. She had to become Abigail Adams. And more than that, when Abigail would be talked about, let's say there was a, a court proceeding or a newspaper talking about her, most likely it wouldn't say Abigail Adams. Most likely that account it might say Mrs. John Adams, but most likely she would have been referred to as John Adams, his wife. In addition to essentially losing her name as part of coverture, there's other restrictions as well. For example, she couldn't sign a contract. She couldn't serve on a jury. She couldn't act on her own to buy property. And unless her husband signed a prenup, any property that she brought into the marriage he could do with as he pleased. So let's say, for example, that Abigail had a beloved horse that she'd had since she was 12, and the horse was named Fluffy. She, once she married her husband, lost any legal control over Fluffy. And if John decided to sell Fluffy so that he could afford to go drinking for seven days straight, there is nothing that Abigail could do to stop him from selling the horse or from spending the money however he wanted. That's because of coverture. Moreover, let's say um, Abigail decided that she wanted to earn a couple bucks by being a teacher. Any money she would earn in that capacity would legally be her husband's and he could do with it as ever he pleased. So those are the laws that women are under. The only women adult women who can act independently are going to be widows. And if a widow, when, when a widow, when somebody becomes a widow, she's entitled legally to a third of her husband's property and the rest of his property would be divided up amongst his children. In general, the sons would get land and the women are going to get more movable property, property that they can take into their husband's houses. So things like furniture, um, or possibly slaves, if the family owns slaves. Uh, once um, a woman became a widow, it was actually her children's, most and more specifically, her son's obligation to support her. Because a widow didn't have a husband to basically subsume her identity, a widow was allowed to act independently as long as she did not remarry. So a widow could own property, enter contracts, or um, resort to the courts to resolve uh, disputes. But no woman, not even a widow, could vote, hold public office, or aspire to become a minister. A married woman in New England was simultaneously a housewife, a deputy husband, a mother, a neighbor, and a Christian. 